Chair Copeland Hansis and members of the committee. Uh, thanks for this invitation. So I'm going to talk just uh, about two things. One is um, the an assessment of the process for collecting uh, race data on traffic stops, and then to talk about the impact of that on racial disparities. Uh, so with regard to what's working well with data collection, all law enforcement agencies are now reporting their data, and that's a good thing. That wasn't happening early on. Uh, and I think a big change has been that the data are now, are now centrally processed and posted on the Vermont Training Council website. Um, I just note to you that they are only hosting the data for 2018 to 2020. The Crime Research Group continues to host the remaining data, and it really should all be in one place. And I'm hopeful that that could happen. Um, I think another important change is that the percentage of stops in which officers uh, did not record the race of the driver has fallen from around 7% to under 1%. So that too is good. Um, I will make the point that, however, agencies are not following the legislation uh, as well with regards to other categories of data that are required. So for example, uh, there's a lot of missing data on very important categories for us to identify racial disparities. The reason for the stop, whether contraband was found and so forth. And I won't go through the details because it's in the submitted, the testimony that I submitted to you. So that, that, that continues to be a problem of data quality. Uh, in terms of what I think is uh, needs some adjustment, if you will, with regard to this process is, first of all, I think it's important to clarify uh, existing legislation and expand the categories of data to report. And I'll just give you one small problem uh, that has arisen uh, and I'll propose a solution to it. Um, for example, in the legislation, it says that uh, officers are required to record the, the outcome of a stop. But many times there are multiple outcomes of a stop. There are you know, two warnings, a ticket and an arrest. And um, uh, unfortunately, police chiefs have refused to give, have did not been willing to give us that data because they say the legislation doesn't require it. So there are these fine tuning uh, aspects that need to be addressed. Uh, uh, in addition to that, we really, there are some expanded categories of data that we do need. And uh, part of this is, uh, I'm gonna make some suggestions based on uh, the research and the work that's done in North Carolina, which I think is exemplary, and also based on a consultant report in Burlington that recommended more data be collected. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of these. One is the start and end time of the stop, which tells you how long people are detained, um, the reason for each ticket, warning and arrest, uh, this is going to, this would enable us to better identify racial bias uh, than the existing data set does. Uh, we'd like data on the, the type and quantity of contraband found, the state uh, in which the vehicle is registered, the year it's registered, and really some trivial things such as the date and time of stop, which again, because it's not in the legislation, many agencies have, have uh, refused to give that data to us, and it's important for a variety of reasons. Uh, so I think those, those categories should be expanded. And I think in general, um, a solution to some of these fixes is that uh, instead of periodically revising the legislation, it would be beneficial and more efficient for the legislature to delegate someone or a group to, uh, to make sure that data is collected uniformly and accurately, that there's consistency, but also that could make changes time to time in the, uh, the, the data requirements, what data should be collected. Uh, I uh, read the H546 that is being considered in the House in the, uh, in the uh, Judicial Committee, and that seems to me to be a step in the right direction. Um, one of the other problems that I see that is very serious is that the data are not reported in a timely manner. We, uh, we just processed 2020 data. Uh, and here we are in 2022. And, you know, the idea is for these data to also be a management tool to monitor what's going on uh, in terms of racial disparities at the municipal level for community members to be aware of this uh, in a much more timely manner. And so I think that that needs to be addressed. I will say again that North, um, that North Carolina and Burlington have interactive data portals and the data are updated once a month. 
So that's an example of what we could do to really make the data more meaningful. Uh, I've mentioned here also that there are continued problems of data quality. Uh, and I'll just let you read that, but uh, I think if you have an oversight body that is uh, reviewing the quality of the data and sending it back to improve it, that, that would address that. Uh, wanted to talk to you then about the impact of the uh, on law enforcement of the requirement to collect traffic stop data. And first, what I'm going to do is just talk to you about trends in the data. Uh, and if you look at the, the uh, testimony I submitted yesterday, I provided you some tables in case some of you are more visual learners, but I'll just briefly uh, say a few things. Uh, my colleagues, Pat Otilio and Nancy Brooks and I published a series of studies last year uh, at the, the statewide analysis of trends. And we did this for the largest agencies, Vermont State Police, Burlington, Bennington, Rutland, Brattleboro, Williston, Colchester, and I think I've forgotten something. Uh, and what we found is that from 2015 to 2019, the number of traffic stops has increased for all racial groups, but it has increased substantially more for groups of color. So for example, uh, for white drivers, stops increased less than about 50%. But for Hispanic drivers, the stops increased by 120%, and for Black drivers, over 70%. The share of stops that are pretextual or investigatory has increased over time. Uh, just a reminder that pretextual stops are legal, uh, but they are typically based on suspicion of criminal activity and use a minor traffic violation as a, uh, a means to uh, stop the vehicle and get a look inside the vehicle. The problem with pretextual stops is they tend to be racially biased because of the suspicion component of this and sort of implicit bias. So pretextual stops have increased and they've increased more for drivers of color. Arrest rates have widened since 2014. Um, and the widening gap uh, is largely due to a decline in the white arrest rate rather than an increase, for example, in the black arrest rate. Uh, search rates, declined for all racial groups since 2019, uh, after which cannabis was legalized, but the cert black search rate continues to be about three times greater than the white search rate. Uh, and uh, a, a, I have a little bit more detail there and I'll skip this uh, just to say, if, not to tax you too much with numbers, but to say that you know, over the, at the state level, we uh, trends don't seem to yield evidence that racial disparities have diminished for most of the indicators that we have, even with legalization. But statewide um, measures obscure a wide variation at the agency level. There are numerous agencies that don't have racial disparities in arrests or searches and so on and so forth. Um, and I wanna just give you some positive news about the largest agencies in, in South Burlington black white arrest disparities uh, and search rate disparities decreased since 2015. In Burlington, South Burlington, Rutland and Vermont State Police, racial disparities and contraband hit rates have decreased. And, um, and we see that um, with, in 2020, we just came out with a COVID analysis of traffic stops that I sent to you also, and traffic stops declined 40%. It didn't do much to reduce racial disparities in stops, but it did reduce uh, disparities in arrests, uh, racial disparities and arrests in searches. Uh, I will note that Vermont nevertheless continues to stop many more vehicles than the national average. Nationally before COVID, around 81 vehicles were stopped per 1,000 residents annually. And in Vermont, that number was over 300. Some agencies in Vermont had numbers up to 700. Uh, COVID has reduced that, but we still have a very wide disparity. Uh, so in general, just to remind you that there's tremendous variation across agencies. And I think the fact that some of the largest agencies have reduced disparities and that there are a number of smaller agencies that <clears throat> have very little disparities tell us that there is room for progress, that progress can be made. So let me just say very briefly about what has been the response of police chiefs and community members to race data collection. Um, I would say that the response of police chiefs has been very uneven. Several agencies have demonstrated a really strong interest in the data and in understanding the causes of the data. And uh, we 
uh, we get calls sometimes from these agencies to talk about what the results are and to, uh, in some cases, we've done additional data analysis for those agencies. And I want to emphasize that Vermont State Police continues to be a leader in attempting to implement protocols and procedures to arrest, uh, address racial disparities. Uh, and some others like South Burlington really stands out to me as a leader in trying to use these data uh, in, a, in a way to help them improve with regards to racial disparities. I've mentioned some others here, uh, Wyndham County Sheriff's Office, Winooski PD, and the Shelburne Select Board have invited us to pre present our data. Um, there are um, the, um, one of the challenges is that, however, that the, the most agencies have not contact, contacted us and we don't see uh, much interest in the data. And in some cases, uh, agencies are continuing to deny that there are racial disparities and to, um, to uh, so they really don't seem to be um, on board with the, rate, the race data collection as a mechanism for self-reflection, if you will. Uh, but I, I will say that one of the things that has been important is that we did our analyses in a way that we hoped was accessible to community members because at the municipal level, it is primarily the community that holds uh, police departments accountable. And we have had numerous calls from community groups uh, across the state to talk about the data, to, um, you know, to, to discuss the issues and so forth. And I've listed them here. And I think one of the most interesting cases was for Jens in which uh, two community members actually did a documentary uh, to try to understand uh, the, the race data, but also to move forward with a, a civilian oversight board and more momentum with regard to addressing racial disparities. Uh, I'll leave it at that and I'm happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, this is one of those questions that may be misinterpreted and get me in trouble. Uh, but do you track in any way a change in the data that you've just laid out as the force itself becomes more diversified and uh, reflecting more of the community in terms of racial or other structures? That's such a great question. Uh, again, if it's not required by legislation, uh, so for example, it would be great to have the composition, uh, the racial and, and gender composition of the police department and quite frankly, the race and gender of the officers, although anonymously, right? I do think we actually do need officer level data. Uh, once again, anonymized, but to give us a sense of that. So uh, Representative Hooper, we, we don't track that because we don't have that data. I will say that um, the number of officers of color is so small also, it might be difficult to, to, um, to detect that. Uh, other states do do this. Do this. But it would be, I think it would be an important step to be able to have officer level data on their race and gender. And also actually, uh, also the, their tenure uh, as police officers, uh, because we do see variance amongst younger police officers versus older police officers, those who've been on the force longer. Um, and there are a variety of reasons why that would matter. Yeah, I would agree that in analysis, there are a lot of holes that should be filled. Thank you. Representative Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Dr. Seguino, for testifying this morning. Um, unfortunately, I, I was looking at your COVID data and the, one of the towns I represent and actually live in, Wilmington, um, appears to be at the bottom of your list um, with respect to increases in traffic stops um, during the pandemic. Um, that's embarrassing for me. Um, as a select board member, I will put this on our agenda as soon as possible so I can better understand it. But I just wanna make sure I understand the data. Does it take into account staffing um, of a police department? Because I know we have struggled with staffing and have finally started to um, uh, you know, bring more officers on. Um, so I was just wondering if that's something that's taken into account here. No, uh, I read that about Wilmington that they were staffed up and were that might be one of the reasons that there were more traffic stops. So one way to get at that in Wilmington is look at the number of traffic stops per officer. And that might be a better way for you all 
to get a better sense of that. So you could easily do that if you have that data. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Representative Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Dr. Seguino, good to see you again, and thank you for your testimony. Um, it's, it's rather disheartening to learn that some of our agencies aren't taking this seriously. Um, but my question is, is it possible for a law enforcement agency to um, contract out the data collection uh, to share, say, maybe? And if so, um, is that done at the same level of collection as other agencies or not? I don't, I don't think any agency contracts out their data. There are two systems that are used, Spillman and Valcor, and agencies have one or the other. And uh, my understanding now is that that is all then uh, extracted by the Vermont Training Council uh, to post. So I, I think a, a, a problem is that probably the smaller agencies aren't able to analyze their own data. And that's why waiting a year to get the results is, is not a good idea. Uh, that's why I think a, a dashboard, uh, you know, an interactive portal that agencies could check their numbers every month or every four months would be uh, a better idea. Thank you. Representative Vyhovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Sweeno. It's nice to see you. Um, one of the things that you had mentioned, I too am sort of disheartened to hear that there's uneven um, uptake and, and interest in this area. And one of the things you had mentioned is having an oversight body review and send back um, lower quality data. Do you imagine that that would be something done at the state level or better done at a more local level? I know we don't have those oversight bodies, but I'm just trying to get a sense of where you, in, in your view, that would make the most sense. Well, uh, I see that Captain Kessler is here um, and I, be, I think she might be able to speak to how Vermont State Police does it, but I mean, there's essentially a process in which supervisors review uh, incident reports. And I think with appropriate supervision, you can send it back to the officer and say, fill in these missing categories. I also think that something that can be done and should be done at the state level is training on um, how to use the data, what the categories mean so that officers have a consistent understanding of what the categories are that they're checking off. Vermont State Police did this early on, right after our 2017 study, they did uh, made an enormous effort, training effort at all of their barracks to train officers on, on data collection. Uh, I don't think this has been done in many of the smaller agencies. And I, I get that, I really get the challenges of the smaller agencies. So I think this is something that could be more effectively done at the state level. But in terms of monitoring tickets, uh, or I'm sorry, incident reports, that seems to me that that should be something of daily practice. And I, I you know, some agencies um, have just done a phenomenal job at this. And I, again, I point to Vermont State Police, which has, I think, 0% missing data now. Uh, and other agencies just continue to have swaths of missing data. So I, I, I think it's a local level, but I also think that it's not, it's not hard. I mean, we, we do it with a, a we have, we've programmed it now, but you know, in a nanosecond, we can identify the missing data for an agency. And uh, it shouldn't be difficult for any agency to do that or for the Vermont Training Council to do it and send the data back to the agency. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you for the second bite at the apple, Madam Chair. Uh, Stephanie, uh, following up on Representative Grant Gannon's question, uh, how is the data normalized if we're not looking at variances in departments when we're reporting? And is it then valid comparing the apple to the apple in the overall? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, so what, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with normalize, so you don't want to compare the number of traffic stops in Burlington with the number of traffic stops, let's say in, I don't know, uh, Heinsberg, because it's such a small, it's a much smaller town with a smaller police force and so forth. Most of our numbers, we do, we do address that. So for example, most of the time what we're doing is looking at percentages and that's the way to normalize the data. So if we say 
the number of stops of black drivers, or I should say of searches of black drivers, uh, then we will normalize it by the number of stops of black drivers. So we do correct for that in all of our data. Thank you. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, Stephanie. How are you? It's nice to see you again. You too. Um, I, I got a couple questions. Uh, one being in, in, in your research, do you folks actually do any field work? Have you gone out with officers and actually spent the time with them to understand the processes that they have to go through? Yeah, I've, I've done uh, ride-alongs with numerous agencies. I've probably done about 10 ride-alongs uh, thus far. I actually, I continue to do them. I learn a lot from them. Uh, but yeah, I do, yeah, I do consistently do ride-alongs. So you, you've done 10 over how many years? Uh, over maybe the last three or four years, three years, maybe four years. Okay. Not much during well, COVID, but uh, I have done a couple during COVID, but uh, uh, prior to that was doing them pretty regularly. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, another question I have is you were making a comparison to our stops to, I think per 1000 of population. Have you ever gone back and took a look at the different laws and statute that law enforcement, like say in Vermont, works under versus other states. For instance, I'm thinking, oh, we're, we're having kind of an ongoing dialogue right now about say front license plates. In Vermont, they're required, in other states they may not be, or license, or excuse me, or seat belts. Are, you know, have you gone through to take a look at the, the different reasons why law enforcement would stop somebody in Vermont versus where they would in another state? Uh, no, we haven't done that. There's not really a national database that would allow us to do that easily. Um, uh, so, so I, let me see if I can understand kind of the, the purpose of your question is to maybe get at the issue of whether uh, the higher number of stops per capita uh, in Vermont is related to us having maybe more stringent traffic laws. Is that your point? Yes. Yeah. That's, so that's a more we, elegant way to put it. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, uh, so we haven't done that, you know, um, but it's a really good question. But the way I guess I would get at that is to say that in Vermont, all, all uh, agencies operate under the same traffic laws, but we see, for example, that I, um, if I recollect correctly, Vermont State Police last year stopped uh, 43 drivers per capita, whereas uh, some towns like Bennington and Brattleboro were stopping over 400. Uh, uh, the stops were four, over 400 per 1,000 residents. So within the same state, we see very, you know, significant variation. Okay. And I guess just one other quick question, and it, 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 it maybe it's more of a statement. It just, it concerns me that the data that I'm hearing that we're having to collect, and then the data that I hear you say you wish that we collected, um, I, I'm just not sure is, is that feasible in that you know, we, we want to limit the interaction with law enforcement and the people that are stopping, and it seems like that the officers are going to have to walk away with somewhat of, of a short novel of the information that, that we're looking to acquire here. And is it just, is it realistic to be able to expect officers to do that? Yeah, that's a really good question too. And, you know, I, I really, you know, share your concern. I think collecting too much data is, you know, too onerous. Um, but this is what I'm thinking about this, that, um, that much of the additional data that I suggested be collected is already automatically collected. It's just not shared with the public because it's not required by law. So the start and end time of the stop is automatically generated. Uh, the state in which the vehicle is registered, all of that is automatically generated. So it's more of a question of simply requiring that that data be publicly shared. Very good, thank you. Representative Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Seguino, um, what are some best practices for agencies um, to be held accountable for collecting data and, and using the data? 
whether it's in state or out of state. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that one of the best practices that I see is uh, at the Vermont State Police. I'm not doing this because I see Captain Kessler in front of me, but because I continue to <laughs> see Vermont State Police as a model. Uh, one of the things that uh, Vermont, and I, I should, you know, I mean, Captain Kessler can say this for himself, but what they do is that when they look at their data and if they see that there are significant uh, disparities for one officer compared to another, uh, they call the officer in to talk about it, to see what's going on. Uh, they, if there are complaints filed, um, I, I was, a case was shared with me in which a, a com there was a complaint filed by a black family and the, op the trooper was called in to look at the video and to compare that to the video of his performance with white drivers, for example. So, um, so I think the data in and of itself generates a conversation and uh, the, the deeper scrutiny at the, at the agency level is what is needed to get to the bottom of this. They're more, they're, they have more, much more data than we do on the outside to identify that. So those are two practices that I think um, the practice of comparing the data of an officer with other officers is called internal benchmarking. So same town, same city, same circumstances. If one officer's traffic stop disparities are significantly greater than another's, it's a reason to check into that. Um, some towns like the city of, of Philadelphia, as I've mentioned in my report, have banned pretextual stops because they are not related to public safety. Uh, but they are more related to suspicion of criminal activity and are more open to bias. So that is another possibility. Clearly, you know, training on implicit bias is, uh, I think, important. And um, I would encourage you to talk to um, um, Chief Sean Burke from South Burlington, who, uh, when we talked about this, he, he shared with me that he thinks one of the most important things that can be done is for officers to better understand racial history in the United States mm -hmm. and what is leading to these disparities. So not just implicit bias training. And I think that's something that it's hard for a small agency to mount themselves, but that's something that the state could do, whether it's the Vermont Training Council or some uh, state level entity could support agents, smaller agencies in doing that kind of thing. Thank you. Representative LaFave. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Stephanie, for being here with us today. Um, so when you were comparing um, Vermont State Police having the 43 per capita and then places like Bennington and Brattleboro, did you, do you have the data of what the state police that covers Bennington and Brattleboro did compared to what, say, if they, what they would do up in Orange County? Uh, no, but I can easily get that data. That's a great question. And we, we can get that data for you. If you would. Uh, and uh, I'm not trying to just put them on the spot. But for me, so I live in Orange County and I know the amount of times I've seen a state trooper pull somebody over or the time I've even seen somebody on my road. Um, it, it's very minimal. Um, I do appreciate the work that they do, but the presence is smaller versus uh, you know, the, the state police on the interstate or in a major area. So I'd just be interested to see while there is 43 per capita, how much that has gone up um, in areas around. And then um, my second question was um, for, the play, for the departments that don't uh, participate as well as we would like, do we have a way that maybe their uh, local government could reach out to them to say, you know, why are you not participating? Um, is information that we need versus the pressure coming from you consistently, but um, from us to say, hey, like we, we would like this information, this information could be helpful um, and see what we could do to help them. I know funding and staffing is very overwhelming or you know, underwhelming for a lot of places. Um, the Vermont State Police, last thing we heard last year, they were down at least 40 troopers and I'm sure that's only gone up. Um, so I know our local municipalities are also really hurting and so, if there's something that we can do on our end to support them. Um, I'd also like to hear that because if we're gonna you know, say they're not doing a good job, I would like to assist them um, in helping. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. So we have, uh, we, have we, pr we produce a, um, a table that shows missing data for each category, for each agency. And um, I mean, that's something we can share and post. And then I think, uh, you know, I think 
the public and whether it is the select board or the city council or the Vermont uh, League of Cities and Towns, for example, I do think there's an entity that could, you know, use these data to call the agency and see what's going on and see if they can uh, make some improvements. I think that if people don't use the data and um, that, you know, some ag agencies continue to not feel that this is an important exercise. Uh, so they're, you know, I think registering interest in what the results are will shine a light on this and perhaps draw attention to it. And I, I don't, I, I agree with your point that there are a lot of competing demands, but I will say the following that uh, the, there was a lot of missing data initially in the first few years of data collection and it's declined dramatically for smaller agencies and larger agencies, but, uh, but not for all of them. All right, any other questions from committee members for Dr. Seguino? <clears throat> All right, hoping that you will stick around. Um, we'll continue on this topic for, uh, for quite a bit longer, I would imagine. Um, so thank you for being with us this morning. Thanks for having me, thanks. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Dr. Etan Nasreddin Longo. Um, uh, Dr. Nasreddin Longo is the chair of the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel, and I believe also the um, co-chair or co-director of Fair and Impartial Policing. How, I think it would be helpful for this committee to understand, um, you know, a little bit of the history of the organizations that you are um, involved in, just for the for the benefit of new members to the committee who uh, who weren't here when these were created. I would be glad to, Madam Chair. May I also ask though that um, that Captain Kessler present her testimony before I do, but I'm willing to, I mean, I'll do that right now and tell you the history if you'd like. Um, let, let's get a little orientation and then I understand Captain Kessler has a time constraint. And so um, let's, let's, let's get oriented from you by, you know, uh, on what these uh, entities are. And then we'll jump to Captain Kessler and come back to you. Thank you. Okay. Fair and impartial policing has been an initiative in um, the state police for, good Lord, way over a decade, way, way over a decade. Stephanie would be helpful in telling me how much time it's been because she was involved in it then and certainly was Curtis Reed. This was under Commissioner Baker at that time that um, there, was an, there was a push towards what was being called at that moment, ironically, bias-free policing as though such a thing is even possible in a human. Um, that has, as it started out with, these, with um, measuring traffic stop data, um, there was a committee that was put together, the uh, FIP committee, Fair and Impartial Policing Committee that meets quarterly um, and that committee is advisory to the Colonel and to the Commissioner of Public Safety regarding progress being made towards the amelioration of disparities within traffic stops. Um, the, as um, Dr. Squino points out, things have improved as time went on. I mean, initially when the data was rolled out, we were all rubbing our heads going, oh my God, I mean, there was so much missing. And I mean, I think Dr. Seguida probably has the stats on how much was missing. I can't remember, it was a lot. Um, but that has improved as she has pointed out enormously. Um, there was at that time all, uh, a bit later, the idea of a director of fair and impartial policing and community affairs was put together. The first person in that role is now retired Major um, Ingrid Jonas. She did that for a very long time. Um, at that point, she was a captain when first appointed. Um, after her appointment uh, promotion to major, uh, Captain Gary Scott took over and he and I worked together on this initiative. Uh, I was a volunteer. I simply believe in this as a kind of service. Um, as Alice Walker once said, her activism is the rent she pays for living on planet Earth. 
and I sort of feel the same way. Um, what then ended up, um, we then had Captain Julie Scribner who retired in November. And now we have, and when she came on, the idea was to in fact, break the position into two and have a civilian co-director along with a sworn member as a co-director and we work together. It's turning out to be fabulous because there are so many things that we each have expertise in. I'm certainly way more conversant with the various communities um, than perhaps the sworn member may be that flows certainly and it, you know, there's differences, but um, the co-directorship has allowed in its sharing of duties for a broader range of duties to be covered. Um, the job continues to evolve. In some ways, we are still writing our job descriptions. Um, and in some ways, that's part of our job is to continue writing our job descriptions. Um, and of course, to continue to work with um, our people in training them, doing anti-bias training, doing um, implicit bias work. Um, when I do that, I also, just to sort of reference Dr. Seguino's point, um, I also reference a lot of American history um, around bias. Um, I've been doing that for a long time. I continue to revise that. Captain Kessler and I do these trainings together. Um, we do them around the state, various municipalities by word of mouth know that we do this regularly and ask us to, to participate in this. So we have a lot of also uh, connections with the police academy um, because we, a lot of our work is conducted there. So that would be what I'd say about the Fair and Impartial Initiative within BSP. The RDAP, which is formerly known, and I get this wrong every time because its title is ridiculous. It, the Advisory Panel on Racial Disparities in the Juvenile and Criminal Justice Systems. We call it the RDAP, Racial Disparities Advisory Panel. That came together in 2017 as a result of Act 54. We are charged to write a report, at least by statute, every two years regarding the amelioration of racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system and to make recommendations for that. Um, what has happened in practice is we have actually submitted a report in 2019, we submitted a report in 2020, and we submitted a report in 2021, so we're a little bit ahead of schedule. The report that we were produced in, la in last year that was uh, submitted on November 15th contained all the information that has gone into the creation of H546, which is currently in front of you all. Um, that was the work of the RDAP. We put together a working group and worked on it from the beginning of August until the middle of um, November. We have been concentrating very heavily on these issues of data and data collection and in fact, that is the point of H546. Um, it, it really is focused on data and creating a division of racial justice statistics, which could be at a another moment, it be expanded to include more than just race and include other vectors of human identity. Is that enough, Madam Chair? That's perfect, thank you so much. You're more than welcome. Um, so we will come back to you in a moment for, uh, for some more comments and questions, but I um, uh, wanted to take this time to welcome Captain Kessler and uh, thank you for stepping into this very important role um, and uh, would love to hear some reflections from you on issues around uh, data collection, uh, challenges with data collection and any uh, any directions you see pushing this in the future in your agency. Good morning, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, beg your forgiveness here that I am getting over a cold or COVID or whatever, I'm not sure. Uh, I tested negative, but uh, now being told that things tend to test negative now. So that's 
that's how it's going. But uh, my voice will come and go a little bit, it's a little scratchier than normal. So anyways, um, thank you so much for having me here. And I just want to introduce myself. I am a 25 year veteran with the Vermont State Police. Um, worked in every uh, division that we have, support services right now. Uh, I've done training division, uh, detectives, and spent the bulk of my career on the road as a trooper. So um, I know all about traffic stops. Well, I shouldn't say all, there's always stuff to learn, but I'm quite familiar with traffic stops and the nuances and problems that we encounter. So uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Um, but today I'm here to talk to you about traffic stops. Uh, traffic stops are a function of being a police officer and an agent of public safety. Aggressive driving and law violations threaten the safety of our citizens and their driving public. This year, due to COVID, we saw a dramatic drop in traffic stops for Vermont State Police. As a result, we've seen a spike in highway fatalities, as you can imagine. Uh, 61 in 2020, 72 in 2021. This is all up from 2019, which was 47. It's not we were moving in the right direction in 1947, or excuse me, where we had 47 in 2019, but obviously not. So I can go over now our traffic stop data. Uh, the 2020 summary is that we had 24,000 stops roughly. 92% were white, 2.9% were black, 2.5% were Asian, 1.9% were Hispanic, and 0.12 were Native American. This is all based on officer perception. So this can be greatly flawed. Um, we're not asking people on these stops to declare um, how they identify. So that would lead to its own set of complications. But again, this data is, we have to take it with a grain of salt because it is officer perception. To cover searches, we have 88 in total for the year. That's 88 out of 24,000 stops. 75 of those were for white operators. Six of those were on black operators. Um, the black operators, that was 0.024% of our traffic stops. Two searches were on Asian operators, five were on Hispanic, and none were on Native Americans. So if we look at this data again, it's very, very low numbers. Um, six black operators also had a 100% hit rate for contraband. So that is, that's something we're really proud of um, because years ago, it wasn't like that. So I think we can say that something is working, um, but again, the numbers of these stops and searches is so small that we actually don't know if the numbers are moving in a positive direction. We'd like to think that they are, so. Hopefully, that means we're doing something right, right? <laughs> what the small numbers did do for us is allow the breakdown of searches and to do a very partial qualitative analysis rather than quantitative. Because as we can tell you all day, numbers are numbers and you know there's always something behind the numbers, um, but we haven't been able to dig very deeply into them as to what they mean. What we found for the like, six black operator search out of 24,000 car stops was that all were found to have contraband, but only three were arrested. The three that were arrested were these three cases. I can tell you that they were male operators. Two were on the interstate and had out of state plates. One was on a secondary road. Speed was the reason for the stop in all three cases. One was 80 and a 55, one was 104 and a 65, and one was 94 and a 50. As you can imagine, um, we feel that these stops were justified. In December of 2021, VSP went to a new statewide computer-aided dispatch system. Um, this is Valcor. Previously, we had been on Stillman. So I believe that now almost everybody on the, in the state for police departments is on Valcor or hope to be on soon. I'm not sure if there may be one or two police departments that are not on Valcor. But what this is going to do for us is going to mean that all agencies are in the same reporting platform. This is where we record the tickets. This is where we record um, the incidents. This is record all the names that we encounter and everything is merged in one place. So this should make analysis much easier and that is the goal. So um, 
the look at the numbers initially appears again that due to COVID and possibly other issues, traffic stops for Vermont State Police are going to be down another 55% from 2020. So initially looking at the numbers that I just barely got and haven't had time to look at really is that 2021 is going to have less stops. It's, I think, around 10,000 stops or 11,000 stops down from 24,000. And that's just for Vermont State Police. I'm not talking about law enforcement statewide. I don't know what their numbers are. Um, we're just beginning to compile this data. However, with all of this data, we would actually like to request that a qualitative excuse me, analyst be hired to interpret that data to be sure we're moving in the right direction. We would also like to ask that we have some time to work with this data and to see if our trainings and policies are truly having the desired effect. Uh, we ask a lot of our troopers, we've asked them to report out on this stuff with the, the race data collection. And I'm, I, I know we've talked about like collecting more and more data and reporting out more and more data. We certainly have a lot of data but I think we may muddy the waters if we start throwing in a lot of different things. Um, we've definitely seen improvements over the last several years as far as our traffic stop data and resolving racial disparities or at least narrowing them. I don't know that we're ever gonna be able to resolve them, but we can get them down to a number that is a lot more positive. Um, excuse me. We'd like to remind this committee that our work towards resolving traffic stop disparities is constantly in motion. This is not a race with a finish line where we can say we have reached perfection and have no need to continue this work. This fair and impartial policing initiative must continue as we're dealing with changing human behavior. It's not just the behavior of new troopers that are coming on that need training um, as they're hired each year. But we're talking about that changing the behavior of the driving public, some of whom choose to break the law and endanger others. Our work here is never done and we're asking for your input and help on how we can improve this, our function of protecting all people in the state of Vermont. Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions from committee members. Representative Higley seems to be leaning in. Go right ahead. Thank you and uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm interested in the, the different um, descriptions by the officers when a stop is made. And, and I believe this is, has been going on for a while where it's uh, their interpretation of, of uh, what group is, is being stopped. Um, is there training around that? And I guess, uh, the other uh, question I've got is, especially for Native American groups, how is that even considered? Yeah, that's a very loaded question. It's something that we're really not sure how to reconcile. Um, we train them in how to fill out the form that we have, which is on the back of the tickets. Well, I say back, it used to be paper tickets. I'm very old. Um, but now it's all done by e-ticket. And they have to fill out certain things, you know, um, the things that we collect. So we can't train them on how to perceive someone. Um, we do train them to say, like, because one of the things that always confused me was, um, especially people who appeared possibly to be of Middle Eastern descent. And I'm like, <laughs> there's there's no box for that. I don't I don't know how to fill that out. Um, and the, there's confusion on that. Um, a lot of these say uh, maybe it's uh, Asian or white or it, it, so it's really, really difficult. And without having a class in racism, basically, you can't define how to define someone, um, mm. which isn't in fact, I think racist. <laughs> yeah. or, you know, so that that's really hard. Um, and actually, Dr. Mercedes Avila, who is doing fair and impartial policing training uh, this year through the VPA, um, actually has a section in her training talking, and she actually has pictures of 10 people that she puts up, and she says, identify the race of this person as you're putting it out on ticket. I got nine out of 10 wrong, because we are, we are a mixed country, and proudly so. 
Um, mm. I, that's a really hard yeah. question. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for that. And I can understand that uh, being very hard. Uh, I guess just one other follow up question is, um, is there a box that is checked for whether there is a, it is a nighttime stop or a daytime stop? I suppose that would be with the, t the time, right? Okay. Correct. Good. Yes. Okay. And actually what I didn't mention because uh, Dr. Nazar and Longo gave such a lovely overview of our fair and impartial policing um, duties. One of the things that we do do is we review every traffic stop. Um, so we have a what's called a data dashboard and that very simply collects all of the information from the tickets and warnings and stops basically um, we go in we look at it quarterly or bi-monthly and we actually review we can go in so granularly and look at the trooper the town the barracks um, the time of day, we can separate all that out and produce reports. And every quarter we meet with the station commanders and we go over this and we review to see if there's any outliers. So if someone stopped um, uh, five black operators in the past two months, that looks a little funny. <laughs> but again, numbers can be really misleading. Um, so say you know, they normally patrol one area. They could have stopped one person three times. Like say this person just has a heavy foot, you know, and they're like, hey, I, I told you last time, you know, you came through here. I know you're on your way to your vacation, but uh, you got to slow it down. And uh, there is a phenomena that we definitely see, and I can voice this as a road trooper for many years, that um, anyone coming from like Massachusetts, Connecticut, the city tend to get a little heavy on the pedal when they have free reign. Like they don't have that bumper to bumper traffic keeping them in check <laughs> and they just go. So sometimes they need a little reminder like, hey, you might want to slow down a little bit. Um, yeah. So yeah, so we can see the time of day of stop and we can produce that, yes. Well, thank you and thank you for your work. It sounds like you're, you're doing a good job. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Barb. How are you this morning? I'm wonderful. How are you? Good. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, kind of the same question that I asked uh, Dr. Sabuino as far as um, the laws that we have in Vermont, does it require you as in law enforcement to potentially have more interaction with motorists if we're talking just stop data for instance like you know we have a state inspection and obviously we have stickers on our windshields where some states i know don't have that um are there other laws and things that we have that would i guess force you to have more interaction with motorists in vermont than say another state might have I don't know that we have anything that is out of line with any other state. Um, yes, we do have the inspection. There are a number of other states that have the inspection as well. Um, our inspection is, <laughs> I think it's a little funny in that we put the sticker behind the uh, rear view mirror, which I don't know about you guys, but I never walk around the front of my own personal vehicle. I, for whatever reason, I just get in from the rear and and get it. And actually, I, this is really embarrassing. I took it to have the brakes done. And my mechanic was like, can I give you a ticket for having expired inspection? <laughs> and I said, you've got to be kidding me. And I ran around the front and looked at it. And sure enough, the sticker is the wrong color, wrong month. But yeah. Um, so that is one that we have that some other states don't have. I believe Florida doesn't have it. Um, it's, I think it's important to remember that all of our laws are on the books for a reason. They're on the books for the reason of public safety. You know, we stop someone for a headlight out or a tail light out. There's a public safety element. Now, I'm not saying they should get a ticket for that or whatever, but some people may need to have their attention called to that. I got stopped in Maryland for having a tail light out, and that was like oh my gosh what did I do you know was I speeding no I don't think I was speeding you know and uh he's like hey you have a tail light out I'm like I never would have known that now one tail light out not a huge issue but what happens if you don't fix it and then the next the other one goes out then you have no tail light that's a serious 
problem. Like you could actually get in a crash because of that. Like someone could hit you. Um, hopefully they're paying attention. They would see the reflective of, you know, the back, but you know, people don't pay attention much anymore either. So um, right. I want to have all the safety equipment on my car working. And if that takes uh, an officer to stop me and remind me with a friendly reminder, that's great. And that's also where a number of our positive interactions come from. Uh, if an officer stops somebody and just says, hey, I'm, I'm looking out for you. I'm trying to let you know that something's not right with your vehicle or, or hey, you didn't use your turn signal and you almost caused a wreck back there. I think these right. things are important. Well, I'm, and I'm not trying to make the point that they aren't. But what I am trying to understand is if there's something unique about Vermont because it was pointed out that Vermont has significantly higher stops per 1,000 population than a lot of other states. And is there a, I guess, a valid reason for that? Um, just a real quick, I got stopped here the other day because, well, I happen to have a used car dealership. So I have a car with a dealer plate on the back and my dealership plate on the front. The young officer that pulled me over pulled me over because I didn't have a regular plate on the front of my car, was extremely apologetic after he realized what was going on. But I know in some states, um, that's not required. Window tinting, in some states, you can have your vehicle fully window tinted. It's not a problem in Vermont, it can be. So I'm just trying to understand, is there reasons why we would have an increase in interaction with law enforcement around traffic stops, potentially compared to some other state? But thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't make the laws, we just enforce them. So I don't know that we could answer that. But again, we do for a public safety reason. The window tinting is actually for officer safety, I believe. I believe that's so that uh, the officers can see into the car a little bit, um, at least shadows, um, because yeah, not everybody out there is nice. <coughs> Um, I noticed um, Dr. Sabrina's hand popped up during that exchange, so I'm just going to ask if you wanted to uh, comment on this particular. Yeah, I think you know the trend nationally is for to reduce traffic policing um, and to focus more on public safety than other reasons. And a good way to understand whether that's you know a viable. Um, strategy or not is to look at what's happening with accidents as traffic stops decrease. Um, so we, we don't have that data for 20, I don't have it at least for 2020 yet, but uh, if you look at Burlington, Burlington has decreased traffic stops by about 70% uh, from roughly 2016 to 2020. And there's been virtually no change in the number of uh, the accident rate, if you will. So uh, I think that's a useful way to think about, are we over policing in terms of traffic policing and can those resources be better used elsewhere? And just to say that this is a, a national conversation, not just in Vermont, thanks. Uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all presenters. Uh, I wanna go back to the observation um, that uh, nicely fits with a comment we just heard, namely Philadelphia, which has abandoned or um, uh, at least, uh, I guess, I don't wanna say outlawed, but pretextual stops. And uh, it seems to me that temptation, uh, for me anyway, uh, has to be balanced against whether those pretextual stops somehow are productive in the public safety sense, not just in the uh, criminal justice sense. Um, and I'd appreciate any of you commenting, uh, since I suspect, and this has already been commented on, because they are so subjective and uh, can be, uh, pardon the phrase, retroactively gained, uh, it, it, they're troublesome uh, and difficult to, if you will, oversee. But it seems to me a terrifically uh, ripe tool for uh, management and allocation of resources. How much do you spend on road uh, uh, related stuff as opposed to taking time away from other uh, uh, criminal enforcement or public safety kinds of uh, 
a potential application of resources. So is, is the pretextual stop that we heard that Philadelphia has really said no more, or at least for time, time being, and see what happens. Is that a, is that a tempting avenue uh, to both address the bias issue, but also the amount of resources that are committed to stops, which may or may not be productive and may or may not change public safety stats? Thank you. Could somebody tell me what a pretextual stop is? What, explain that to me. Sorry. I can, I can explain that for you. So a pretextual stop, the term is used uh, to describe a stop that is <clears throat> not based in public safety in nature, um, usually used as an excuse to stop a car. Um, so that's, that would be like, you know, maybe saying that an officer is pulling someone over for a headlight out when in reality, they just want to stop the car. So, and I can say that like <laughs> pretext stops used to be a big thing when like drug interdiction was a thing. Um, but that doesn't really happen here. It doesn't happen. Um, I mean, look at our hit rate for black operators is 100%. Our, we, we're talking about six black operators were searched 0.024% of 24,000 stops. We are not stopping people for just to get in their car, like making up a, a, a or picking up on some little violation saying, oh my goodness, like, look at that. You know, now I can stop this car. That is not what we are about. Um, we stop for public safety. Um, as you can see, the reduction in our stops has resulted in a significant increase in fatalities. We want to protect people and we constantly, um, I was a station commander for four years. I fielded so many calls, requests for patrols. Please come to my road. People are speeding up and down it. People are driving recklessly. Someone almost hit me the other day. Please come and patrol. That is what we do. We hit hot areas that are for DUIs, um, you know, maybe around a, a high drinking area or whatever. Um, we stop people for, you know, uh, weaving in, in the lanes, um, weaving outside of the lanes. Um, there's a number of reasons that we need to stop people for public safety. We're not stopping people to get in their cars. So if there was an issue, like I think Philadelphia had an issue and they needed to address it. We don't have a problem here, so we don't need to address that. Um, can I just ask a follow-up question? Um, and then I see Dr. Seguino's hand is up. Do you mean we don't have a problem as in you're speaking for Vermont State Police, or do you mean we don't have a problem in that you think there are not agencies in the state of Vermont who have a, who, who necessarily are um, abusing an excuse to stop a motorist? I could speak only for Vermont State Police. However, uh, the, also when I was reading the articles about Philadelphia's pretext stop, that was done because um, they were having shootings of unarmed civilians after traffic stops and, and fatal encounters with them or, or violent encounters with them. Have we ever had that? <laughs> we haven't. Like that's, that's the issue that they're trying to fix. We don't need to do that. We're stopping again for public safety. I, again, I can't speak for every agency, but looking at our numbers statewide, we don't have stops where someone has a violent encounter with the police because of a, a pretextual stop. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Seguino. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to make that point as well, that although this may not be an issue with Vermont State Police, it is with other agencies. And uh, it's one of the reasons that we've asked for, we, I just requested that you expand the data on the reasons for the stop so that we can better identify pretextual stops. Right now, we just have a rough measure. But I wanna say also, uh, Texas, the state of Texas, is uh, pursuing legislation to ban pretextual stops. The Oregon Supreme Court banned pretextual stops. Uh, Massachusetts legislature is moving to ban pretextual stops as well. And I think that, you know, in these issues that you have to uh, weigh the fact that it is more likely to be drivers of color who are stopped on a pretext 
uh, than our white drivers, that you have to weigh the impact on the community of color of these things. Uh, it promotes a distrust between the police and the community, not just for drivers of color, but for all drivers to be stopped for minor violations. And so you have to weigh the impact of that. I think we have a crisis in public safety and a great mistrust of police. And so to the extent that the police are engaged in activities that are not really focused on public safety and traffic stops, that that may be a good move. And it certainly is a way to address racial disparities in traffic stops. And I just wanna give you an incident from Burlington. Um, a few years ago, uh, a young woman from the University of Mont Vermont uh, contacted me. She was a graduate student uh, at UVM. She's a black woman. And uh, she stopped at a street corner in Burlington and on the opposite corner was a police officer. It was at night, but they could clearly see each other. He then proceeded to follow her weaving in and out of the old North End and finally put his light on and stopped her when she pulled in front of her house. And what he told her was the reason he had stopped her was that she, um, she had uh, not turned on her turn signal a uh, uh, hundred feet before the stop sign. And I, I just want you to know, she was very clear, it was pretextual. She was traumatized by this. She, uh, she's a young woman from Georgia. She didn't anticipate being treated that way in Vermont. She went home. She didn't go to classes for two weeks because of the fear that this generated in her and the, 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 the perception of being targeted. So I think we have to consider all of these, all of these ramifications and to really think about focusing on what traffic policing is. If there is an issue of you know, other criminal activity, detective work can get us to more closely hone who we are stopping uh, and pursuing in a way that doesn't cause these disruptions to citizenry that ultimately undermines, undermines trust in policing. And I think you know, we all want that. We want to improve that relationship. And so we, we should think about uh, ending pretextual stops. I think when a state like Texas uh, is uh, uh, on the verge of banning them. Uh, I think it, it says something and we might think about that here in Vermont. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Representative Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Captain Kessler for your testimony. Um, on a personal note, I, I just wanna share that I and my two beautiful black sons have had many, many experiences with pretextual stops by police more than I ever want to remember. So it is an issue. And actually I wrote an op-ed many, many years ago that it was an epidemic in Burlington at that time. Uh, and I, I presented an op-ed on driving while black in Vermont. So it's here, it's real. Um, I just want to share a story about why this work is important. Several years ago, the president of the National League of Cities and Towns uh, came to Vermont an African-American. He flew into Burlington Airport, rented a car, and proceeded to drive to Montpelier, where he was going to in inspect a potential site to have a national meeting. Along the way, he got a phone call. So he pulled over. And no sooner than he pulled over and got on the call, he saw these blue flashing lights pull up behind him. Oh, crap. He said something else. Um, he was in fear, once again, of driving while black. Instead, the state police officer pulled up and asked him, is there anything he can do to help him? He was shocked. That's not what he expected. He proceeded on his trip. He made the decision to come to Vermont with this national meeting. And that's the impact of this. Clearly, we have got to get this right. As we look forward, if there's no way our economy is gonna be sustainable if we don't attract and support people of color. That's what's driving our population growth in Vermont and our country. So this is a very important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Colston. Uh, Representative Vyhovsky. 
Um, thank you, everyone, and, and thank you, Rep. Colston, for, for sharing that. Um, I am sort of thinking larger than simply pretextual stops, but I'm wondering if there are actually some stops that we could eliminate as stops and use an alternate form of, of notification. An example I have is if someone had a taillight out, could we rather than stop them have a, a notice mailed to their home that said, you have a taillight out, get it fixed? You know, that my understanding is that all that, that data would be available by running the registration. So I'm wondering if that's a method of of a utilizing our resources towards towards real public safety, immediate public safety issues, and also you know potentially taking lowering our traffic stops and and taking one place where bias could happen sort of out of the mix. Not but and and really I, I don't think it could, would only be a tail light. It could be you know any sort of defective equipment. I'm wondering what thoughts are on on that. I would be fine with that. <laughs> Um, Representative Lefebvre. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not sure if, um, oops, sorry, he put his hand down. Um, Dr. Bean had his hand up. I don't sure if you wanna go first. Okay, um, so I have a couple of questions and I apologize. They're from a little bit back in our testimony. Um, so um, Captain Kessler, do you have the data from when you said how many um, people were pulled over from the from BSP about how many were in-state residents or people that were just traveling through? I don't expect that now, but would that be something that, that would be available to us? Um, I can only, I, I have data that it says uh, out-of-state plates. Um, so we would assume that they are out-of-state residents. But yes, um, we do have that data and we can supply it to you. And I, I fully understand that could be a Vermonter using a rental. That could be somebody that bought a car and hadn't transferred plates yet. Um, and, and then also, sorry, I had them written down. We're going to skip over some that were answered. Um, so when we were talking about Burlington, I think this was Stephanie, um, and how there had been a decrease in stops from 2016 to 2020, but there'd been no change in incident rate. Um, did this factor in the amount of decrease in officers that Burlington has had? Um, this was a policy decision by the police chief. Thank you. Um, and so I have been one of the um, residents that has actually called um, Captain Kessler myself and asked her to please come patrol my area. Um, she used to cover my district. I believe she has moved um, to a different district now. Um, and that is something that is um, a, a danger in the town of Orange where I live. We have uh, Route 302 that runs right down and people seem to think that is um, Calig Caligato sometimes. Um, so with that, I do know that we have asked for them to even sit and like just put their blue lights on, like just make it aware that there's an uh, there's officer present um, in same thing, the same philosophy as going into like a work zone. You have to see the blue lights and your mind says slow down. And so I just um, am wondering if we get rid of some of the traffic stops or if we get some get rid of some of the violation stops as uh, Representative Vihoski said of uh, a taillight, um, which in my my feelings, a taillight being out is a safety concern for the public because you could then not be able to see somebody if, um, if they didn't have the proper lighting around their vehicle. Um, but that's another discussion. So I, my concerns just rise when we start saying you want to lower or get rid of things. Um, I would like people just to obey the law. Um, and it is very disheartening to hear that uh, people are having incidents like this where they are being uh, profiled. And I, I feel the more data we can collect, the, the better, but also getting rid of police. I think we have seen overwhelming evidence around that uh, people sometimes are taking back those words of uh, not having them do certain things because the uh, crime has gone up and uh, accidents have gone up um, and they're asking for support to come back. And when we talk about places like Philadelphia, um, I don't wanna compare our crime rate to theirs. Um, yes, there probably are some things going on there that I would not want to have happen here in Vermont. Um, and I would stand right alongside people to not allow that to happen to our residents or people visiting Vermont. Uh, but I also do not want the lack of um, protection to cause us to then uh, wish we had wish we had help. Thank you. All right, any other questions for Captain Kessler? 
All right, um, Dr. Nasred and Longo, thank you for, um, for, for letting us take Captain Kessler first. And uh, Captain, I hope that you uh, feel better and that whatever it is that's plaguing you resolves itself without too much suffering. <laughs> Thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee, for listening. Dr. Nasreddin Longo, welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me again. Um, there are a couple things that I want to mention in terms of, I mean, uh, what's working? You've heard a lot of what's working. Um, I don't want to be gloomy Gus, but there are some things that we need to make all of, I think, the positive steps that both um, Dr. Seguino and Barb Kessler have mentioned even more um, solid, frankly. Um, one of these things would have to be, um, again, and you all know this, resources. Um, we've already discussed when Dr. Seguino was testifying about what goes on with the smaller departments. Um, this was an issue I brought up in testimony two years ago that people were holding up VSP as a kind of gold standard for data collection. And I remember going, yes. And we have a person who is hired and works for the Agency of Digital Services who enjoys doing data, I'm not gonna comment on that, not gonna comment on that, but she very much enjoys doing this. She does this in her free time. And if that's a gold standard, I'm a little concerned because we have a lot of departments around the state that may be two or three people. And the gathering of the data, at least at that point, was really somewhat, there's, there's a lack of understanding I've noticed, and I say this also as chair of the RDAP, um, about what it requires to do this work. It's a lot more than people understand. Um, and I think that resources need to go out to departments that in fact do not have a lot of people. Um, I've been hearing this anecdotally from different departments, about the kind of troubles that they have. And they know where I stand politically on this. So there's sort of a, you know, there's an immediate like, eh, but they get it. I get it. And I still think that that's something that needs to be brought forth right now. So that was, that's one of the major points that I um, would like to make to you. Um, another one would concern resources at the academy, which is where a lot of the training exists to shape curriculum and programs. Um, that has been desperately needed for some time. Uh, they've been asking for that for some time and that needs to happen. And I can say that certainly from the standpoint of someone who does an enormous amount of training at the academy. Um, there are many other in-service trainings that I can imagine. They literally do not have the resources to support them. I find that frustrating both personally and professionally. And so that would be something else that I would uh, frankly beg the committee to consider. I also know that the Academy needs a data analyst that can provide dashboards around the data that they get, the raw data that they get now. And dashboards meaning something that the public can easily look at, easily access first easily look at and easily understand because the raw data on its own doesn't necessarily tell someone who's not schooled in stats what they're looking at. And so there needs to be more, there need to be more resources dedicated to the interaction between law enforcement and the communities that law enforcement serves. Um, of course, that data um, helps with making policy decisions or training decisions, certainly around not nearly law enforcement, but relationships with the mental health communities, children, the elderly, so on, um, people who are housing, um, who have problems with housing, all of those things. 
Um, and that's why those resources need to be there. So that kind of training can exist and be given, basically, I would feel statewide to as many officers, if not all of them as possible. I think that needs to happen. Um, I certainly know that, the, that um, Director Simons of the Academy feels that policy and data need to go hand in hand with building up scenario training, um, that that's another part of the training, a sort of sub issue here, that's actually fairly expensive, that there need to be resources for. That training works very well. And it, I personally certainly feel needs to be um, facilitated. Um, I think that the, another issue that I would point out would be time that changes are made and changes take a while to take effect. They don't always move as quickly as they might. Two anthropologists who were not my teachers in graduate school, but whose work I know intimately well, once wrote in one of their most famous books that culture is a reactionary formation. And just think about that for a moment. Culture, and this is always, culture is always a reactionary formation, okay? It doesn't happen overnight, given that. What change, I mean, I am not white. I would love change to happen at this very minute. I am also a reasonable person and understand, as I said, culture being reactionary, that's not going to happen. So, we need to have time to see that these measures that we put into place actually bear fruit. If you, have a, if you have an experiment running for a year to ask for results at six months is kind of problematic for a lot of reasons that I don't think I really have to explain. Um, I would say that's really pretty much my wish list as it were. My only other one would be um, the data, the division of data, uh, racial, what are we calling it now? It's had so many names in its incarnations, the division of racial justice statistics. Um, I think that that bears a lot of um, a weight in what's been already put forth here that this would standardize data and that has to happen there has to be a standardization going on. Um, it's very difficult. You, you end up comparing apples and oranges at worst and not even having data in certain circumstances as one of our reports showed at, in another circumstance. So that has to stop as well. And I think that that division um, and its support is essential in all of this as well. Um, the one, I guess one last thing that I would put out is a plea again for qualita a qualitative analysis. One of the things that I certainly know from my professional work, and many of you may know that I do ethnomusicology, species of anthropology, is we write ethnographies. And ethnographies are not totally qualitative, but there are a lot of qualitative. <laughs> Um, they're very qualitative and certainly when discussing smaller populations or indeed smaller populations in larger groups, that kind of approach is important. Now, this is not a zero sum game, right? I'm not saying we'll do away with quantitative analysis. That is not what I'm saying. And I want to go on the record is going, that's not what I'm saying. There's this American tendency to go, it's a one or a zero, not doing that. Um, I just think that we need to put some resources into that as well. Thank you. Um, Captain Kessler. Yeah, just uh, to follow up on that, uh, for the pretext stops, if Vermont State Police is doing well in that area, which I really hope it is um, from your perspective, and the other agencies are not 
I don't know if it's a law issue or banning issue. I think it's a training issue. And I would like to have all the other um, departments experience the same training that we are getting. Um, we are doing all new officers in the basic academy, um, but there are some probably older officers or ones that are out on the road or maybe, I'm not sure, ones that we just haven't gotten to yet. So um, maybe that's an option for you to think about as well, but I just offer that as input. Thank you. Yeah, I think one could reasonably expect that, um, you know, that there probably needs to be sort of a loop of continuous improvement um, and that uh, initial training might be part of it, but that uh, supervision and check-in might be part of it as well. Um, and when I think about the law enforcement landscape across the state, you know, I mean, Vermont State Police is in a in a unique position in that, you know, you have the capacity to, um, you know, to do that internal reflection uh, and to have a conversation with officers whose statistics might, you know, indicate that that they are an outlier. Um, but so many of our law enforcement agencies are, you know, one or two person, three person shops and, you know, the entity that um, the entity that that oversees them is, you know, a largely volunteer select board in a small community where everybody knows everybody. So, um, you know, the 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 opportunities for breakdown of that uh of that need for training, supervision, you know, conversation, retraining, all of that is, uh, is just pretty vast in many of our smaller uh, agencies. And it's a, it's a big concern. Um, questions from committee members. All right. Uh, we have been at this now for an hour and a half, and what I would like to do is just take a 15-minute break, give folks an opportunity to stretch, and we're going to come back and speak with the folks from the Criminal Justice Council. Um, we, uh, I would like to orient the committee to uh, the role of the Criminal Justice Council in, uh, in, in a number of these um, aspects, not only training, but uh, data collection and, and whatnot. And so... Um, Let's take a break until 1045 and